For decades, billions vanished on African tree planting schemes, yet the dry lands only got drier and most seedlings died. The official story says the land was too harsh and restoration was impossible. But across Somalia and seven other nations, an unprecedented program rejected planting in favor of one surprising strategy, protecting hidden living roots. The goal? Restore one million hectares where failure once seemed guaranteed. Why did everyone miss this underground solution and how did protection succeed where planting failed? Across the vast stretches of the Sahel and the Horn of Africa, the land tells a story of struggle. Dry seasons last for months. When rain finally comes, it arrives in bursts, sometimes too little, sometimes too much, and all too often at the wrong time. These unpredictable patterns leave little room for crops or pasture to recover. In many places, annual rainfall barely reaches 300 millimeters, and entire years may pass with barely a drop. The soil, once rich with life, has grown thin and tired. Decades of grazing, farming, and firewood collection have stripped away protective vegetation, exposing bare earth to the sun and wind. Over time, what was once grassland or savanna has turned to dust. Satellite images reveal the scale. Hundreds of millions of hectares across Africa now show the pale browns and grays of degradation. In Nigeria, baseline surveys found just 3% of the land covered with vegetation. In Mali, only 6%. Even in better off areas, the green is patchy and fragile. For the millions of people who depend on these drylands, herders, farmers, and their families, every year brings new uncertainty. Livestock herds shrink as pastures fail, wells run dry, fields produce less food, and families are forced to move or go hungry. The harsh climate is only part of the challenge. When the land loses its cover, the soil itself begins to break down. Without roots to hold it, topsoil blows away in the wind or washes off in sudden downpours. What remains is hard, compacted earth that resists even the toughest seeds. The cycle deepens, less vegetation means less shade, higher temperatures, and even less moisture held in the ground. Trees that once dotted the horizon disappear, and with them go the birds, insects, and animals that depended on them. For decades, the world responded with tree planting campaigns. Billions of dollars went into nurseries, trucks, and teams of planters. But in these dry lands, most of the seedlings withered. The rain did not come, or goats ate the young shoots before they could take hold. Survival rates for planted trees hovered between 15 and 40%. The losses mounted and hope faded. Yet underneath the surface, something remained. Even in landscapes that appeared barren, the roots of native trees and shrubs often survived, waiting for a chance to regrow. The official story overlooked this hidden resilience. Instead, the land was ridden off, too dry, too degraded, too far gone. But for the people living here, giving up was never an option. Restore the land or watch livelihoods disappear. The search for a better answer would have to begin not with new trees, but with a new understanding of what the land could still offer. A program of this scale does not take shape by accident. It begins with a clear target and the resources to match. In 2017, a consortium led by World Agroforestry, known as ICRAF, set out to reverse decades of degradation across Africa's drylands. The goal was to restore one million hectares of land and improve the lives of half a million households. This was not a single country effort, nor a collection of isolated projects. It was a coordinated response designed to test and prove what could be achieved when local knowledge, scientific research, and international support worked in concert. Funding came from the European Union, joined by a network of partners including World Vision, CARE, Oxfam, Catholic Relief Services, and Sahel Eco. Each partner brought strengths in community outreach, technical training, policy advocacy, and local presence. But the backbone of the program remained the research and coordination led by ICRAF. Their scientists tracked progress with satellite imagery, field surveys, 
and a digital monitoring platform that put real-time data in the hands of decision-makers. Every hectare counted toward the continental goal. Every household reached was another step toward resilience. The architecture of the program was built for both scale and flexibility. Restoration targets were set not just for farmland, but also for communal rangelands where pastoralists graze livestock and depend on native trees for shade and fodder. Technical teams worked with national and local governments to align priorities while field staff partnered directly with communities to adapt approaches to local realities. Customary rules and modern science met on the ground, shaping interventions that could be measured, monitored, and above all maintained by the people who lived there. Unlike previous projects that focused on planting as many seedlings as possible, this program structured its ambitions around what could be protected and revived. The focus shifted from numbers of seedlings delivered to hectares restored and households benefiting. Targets were ambitious, and progress was tracked with the precision of a scientific trial. Every district, every site, every partner was accountable for results. This was not simply a campaign, it was a blueprint for continental restoration. By setting clear hectare and household goals, and by investing in the right partnerships and data systems, the program created the conditions for a new kind of restoration, one that could be tested, scaled, and adapted across the drylands of Africa. The groundwork was laid. What remained was to determine which approaches could deliver lasting change on the ground. Beneath the cracked earth of Africa's drylands, a quiet secret lay hidden for decades. What looked like lifeless stumps and bare ground was, in fact, a vast underground forest, roots alive and waiting for a chance to return. Scientists and technical advisors walking these landscapes began to notice something unusual. When they dug into the soil, they found roots stretching deep and wide, some surviving for 20, 30, even 50 years beneath the surface. These roots, adapted to drought and heat, held the memory of forests that once shaded the savanna. The breakthrough did not come from planting new trees. It came from observing what nature had left behind. In field after field, advisors and local land users tested a simple idea. Instead of starting from scratch, what if they protected the living roots already in the ground? The process began with careful selection. Community members walked the land, searching for living stumps or shoots, often overlooked and sometimes mistaken for weeds. Each viable root system was marked and spared from being cut or grazed. The next step was pruning. Instead of letting every shoot compete for sunlight and water, they chose the strongest stems and removed the weaker ones. This focused the plant's energy, allowing the chosen branches to grow tall and strong. The work was hands-on and precise, guided by technical advisors, but carried out by the people who knew the land best. By clearing away grass and brush around the base, they reduced competition and helped the young shoots catch the first drops of rain. Protection was the heart of the method. Livestock, especially goats, posed a constant threat to regrowth. Simple barriers, thorny branches, temporary fencing, and community agreements kept animals away during the most vulnerable months. In some places, local rules were revived or adapted, with elders and herders agreeing on when and where grazing could happen. The goal was not to fence off the land forever, but to give new growth a head start until it could withstand browsing on its own. Results appeared within a single rainy season. Instead of struggling seedlings, the protected shoots raced upwards, drawing on deep reserves stored in their roots. Growth rates were three to five times faster than planting new trees. Survival rates were dramatically higher. Where once only a handful of planted trees might survive, nearly every protected stump sent up new life. Over time, the landscape began to change. Patches of green spread outward from each living root, reconnecting fragments of woodland across the savanna. The real lesson was not about planting at all. It was about seeing the land differently, recognizing that even in the harshest conditions, resilience remains hidden just below the surface. By working with what nature had preserved, communities could restore their environment with less labor, lower costs, and far greater success. The underground forest, once ignored, became the foundation for regreening Africa's drylands. 
pastoral lands stretch for miles across the Horn of Africa, shaped by the footsteps of herders and the grazing patterns of livestock. Here, the rhythm of daily life is tied to the cycles of grass and the scattered shade of acacia trees. For generations, these rangelands have supplied fodder for camels, goats, and sheep, animals that sustain families through both lean seasons and times of plenty. But as the climate grows harsher and the land more fragile, the old ways of managing these commons have come under strain. Overgrazing, drought, and the loss of native trees have left many areas exposed, unable to recover even when the rains return. Communities began to look inward, to their own traditions and collective knowledge. Customary grazing rules, once enforced by elders and clan leaders, were revived or adapted to new realities. In Somalia, these agreements known locally as Zia set out when and where livestock could graze, how long animals could stay in a given area, and which patches of regrowth needed extra protection. The aim was simple, give new shoots a chance to establish before herds returned. These rules were not imposed from outside, but negotiated among those who depended on the land the most. Women's groups and youth collectives took on new responsibilities, organizing patrols to monitor regrowth and resolve disputes over access. In some districts, they ran savings groups linked to tree management, pooling resources to invest in tools or fencing. Elders provided guidance, drawing on decades of experience with drought and recovery. The result was a patchwork of stewardship, where each community adapted the principles of assisted natural regeneration to its own needs and landscape. Training spread from village to village through a peer-to-peer -peer model. Experienced herders shared their techniques for spotting viable stumps, pruning shoots, and building simple barriers to keep livestock away during vulnerable months. Demonstration plots served as living classrooms, where neighbors could see the difference between protected and unprotected land. Over time, a culture of restoration took root, not just as a technical practice, but as a shared responsibility. The benefits were felt quickly. As native trees and shrubs returned, so did the grasses that feed animals during the dry season. Shade offered relief to livestock and herders alike, lowering stress and improving animal health. Fodder became more reliable, reducing the need for long migrations or costly feed. In some places, communities began harvesting honey, fruits, or fuel wood from restored areas, diversifying their incomes while keeping the land productive. By centering restoration on rangelands and empowering local stewards, the program reached beyond the boundaries of individual farms. It recognized that pastoralists are not just users of the land, but its primary caretakers. Their knowledge, honed over generations, became the engine of change. Where once the landscape seemed locked in decline, new shoots signaled a different future, one built on cooperation, adaptation, and the quiet work of regeneration. The story of regreening Africa's drylands is not only about hectares restored or trees counted. It is about communities reclaiming agency over the land that sustains them. Through local stewardship and shared rules, even the most degraded rangelands can recover, offering hope to millions who depend on them for their way of life. Eight countries now carry the banner of regreening Africa's drylands. From the savannas of Ghana to the rangelands of Somalia, this approach has taken root in landscapes as varied as the people who manage them. Ethiopia, Kenya, Mali, Niger, Rwanda, Senegal, Ghana, and Somalia each joined the program with distinct climates, traditions, and land use patterns. National committees, formed by governments, technical agencies, and community leaders, guide the work, ensuring that restoration strategies fit local realities. Knowledge flows across borders as teams share lessons from the field. In Kenya, pastoralist groups borrow monitoring techniques pioneered in Mali. In Rwanda, women's cooperatives draw inspiration from Ghana's success with tree product markets. Technical advisors coordinate regionally, holding workshops where practical experience is exchanged and adaptation is encouraged. Restoration is not confined to a single country or culture. Instead, it spreads through networks, farmer to farmer, committee to committee, country to country proving that assisted natural regeneration can thrive across Africa's drylands. The program's reach is continental, not just in ambition, but in action. Eight nations, each with their own challenges and strengths, validate that protecting and managing what already exists 
is a strategy that works, no matter the context. Numbers tell a story that no amount of optimism or good intentions can dispute. Across Africa's drylands, the cost of restoring a single hectare with traditional tree planting ranges from $150 to $400. For every 100 hectares, that is up to $40,000, much of it lost when seedlings fail to survive. In contrast, assisted natural regeneration operates at a fraction of that expense. The same hectare can be restored for as little as $14, rarely more than $50. The difference is not just in dollars, but in results. Where planting delivers survival rates that hover between 15 and 40%, protection of existing roots achieves 90% or more. Each dollar spent on protection produces living, growing trees rather than dead stumps and wasted effort. The roots of this approach reach back to Niger, where farmers began protecting native stumps in the 1980s. Over the next decades, they regenerated more than 200 million trees on 5 to 6 million hectares without planting a single seedling. That success now serves as proof that protection, not planting, is the engine of large-scale restoration. When the numbers are this clear, the path forward is hard to ignore. Right now, more than 1 million hectares once thought barren are regreening, not from planting, but by letting nature heal itself. As global restoration costs soar, Africa's proof is irrefutable. Protection delivers resilience at a fraction of the price. The world faces a restoration crisis. The solution is underground, waiting. Sometimes the wisest action is to stand back and let the roots rise. Share your thoughts below.